Good morning. I'm Pastor Luke, responsible for discipleship and groups here at CCC. And we are in the middle of our series, Letters to the Church. We've been going through the seven letters to the churches in Revelation. And the whole idea behind this series was that in this season, this election season, and with so much else going on in the world, that we could stay focused on Christ. That we could stay focused on the message that Christ had to these churches 2,000 years ago, who at that time got to see emperors come and go. Wars and rumors of wars. All kinds of things going on in the world. Natural disasters. That in the midst of all of that, Jesus would dictate seven letters, personal letters to churches. With, at the core of that message is to keep their eyes fixed on him. Have I already established the relevance of this today? Okay, good. So as we move through, we're ready for our fourth letter, the church to Thyatira, uh, which is located in what is modern day Turkey. Now, I'm gonna warn you ahead of time, scholars have cited this letter as the longest and most difficult of the seven letters and is addressed to the least known, least important, and least remarkable of the cities. There's some front loading for you. (laughs) So it's interesting as we get into this letter, and there's a lot to cover, that they had a lot of things going for it, but there were some very strong criticism of this church that we're going to unpack today and I think would be relevant for each and every one of us in our own lives, will challenge us to continue to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Now, as I said before, this is, you know, one of the least important cities, least remarkable, but as we leave Pergamos or Pergamum and we're on our way to Sardis and really it I wish I could share all the commentaries because the scholars really talk about Thyatira as it's really the place you could drive through on the way to someplace else, right? And the city was known for its manufacturing. And as we round that bend and come down into the valley, it's, let me describe it this way. Following the overland route from Pergamum to Sardis, Travelers would head eastward along the south bank of the Caicos River, turn southward over a low-lying range of hills, and descend into the broad and fertile valley of the Lycus. The journey would be about 40 miles. Now, as you were descending from the hills into the valley, you would immediately be met with the gleaming white marble pillars of the local temples, many of which were devoted to Apollos Tyrimnos or to one of the emperors now being worshipped as Apollos incarnate. Both as sons of Zeus would bear the title as sons of God. But Thyatira was not a religious center per se. It was dedicated to manufacturing and marketing, as I said. It had a large number of trade guilds that flourished there. There are inscriptions and other archaeological evidence of wool workers, linen workers, makers of outer garments, dyers, leather workers, tanners, potters, bakers, slave dealers, and bronze smiths. We actually read in Acts chapter 16, verse 14, we meet a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who had a house in Philippi. And she becomes instrumental in that church later on. Now, these guilds were dedicated, all of the guilds of the city were dedicated to Apollos Tyrimnos as their patron deity and members would have to pledge their devotion to him to be a member and he would be honored in all of their festivities. Now, I have a confession to make. I like spoilers. I love spoilers. It doesn't matter if it's for books 
movies, TV series, I love spoilers, okay? I've already done some foreshadowing in this message, but I'm about to give some spoilers, okay? And, and really, like, does anybody else like spoilers? Anybody else with me? There's a few of us, okay? Like, it's one of those, when I watch a movie and I already know how it ends and the plot twist, I can look for those details all along the way. I don't know. I just appreciate that. So here I want to give a little bit of spoiler slash like some background, right? Because we're 2,000 years removed from this, this church receiving this letter. And what was really popular at that time, what was really um, known in the churches was Psalm 2. Actually, starting at about 100 B.C., a lot of the Jewish rabbis were reading Psalm 2 and they, it dawned on them that, hey, this is about the Messiah. This Messiah figure, is he the son of God? I, we know that David wrote this. Is, this. is he writing about his son? But then they started digging a little bit deeper and they're like, oh, this is about the Messiah who is to come. And so it really took off. And in a lot of the synagogues, they were reading this Psalm with the intent of looking for the Messiah. Now, let me read this Psalm and we're gonna see this pop up in the letter here in a little bit. Psalm two, starting at verse one. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and their rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship Yahweh with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the sun that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Wow, that's a powerful Psalm. But you can already see a lot of the allusions to Jesus. And really uh, not just in that first coming, but also in a second coming. Now let's read through the letter to Thyatira and see if you can pick up some of these references. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent over her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron and the vessels of pottery are broken to pieces. As I also have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. 
starts off so positive, right? And then just takes this hard left turn, man. So jumping right in, the title and description of Jesus. And so the angel of the church in Thyatira right? the son of God. So as I've already mentioned, this whole city was devoted to Apollos, who is the son of Zeus. And so one of Apollos' title is son of God. So then you have an emperor who gets worshiped as Apollos in the flesh. Well, what does his title become? The son of God. So how appropriate, Jesus knowing this city, knowing this fellowship and what they've had to deal with in the culture and the world around them starts off with his own identity, the son of God the true son of God, the one and only son of God, God of the universe. Jesus is the son of God, not Apollos, not any emperor. He doesn't stop there. He has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. This reference actually goes back to Daniel chapter 10. And let me tell you, if you're ever studying Revelation, you need to read the book of Daniel, okay? So it is the key to understanding Revelation. Daniel in uh, chapter 10, verse six, he makes mention, his eyes were like flaming torches, his arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze. And really these things illustrate the power and authority that Jesus has to be able to speak into the situation. The burnished bronze conveys an idea of strength and splendor. It has been brought through the fire and flawless. And here his eyes are like a flame of fire because he's able to see through the lies, the false teaching and the seductive arguments of the Jezebel figure. That's the whole idea as fire is used to purge infirmities with his eyes being represented by flames of fire that he can see through the false teaching. Now the commendation. This is the good part. This is the good part. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. So the church of Thyatira was active in their faith and not just in a regular church attendance, and maybe having the best worship team or anything like that. Like, no, no, these guys were legit. They were living their faith out every single day. They were going out and ministering within the community. They were seeing people come to Christ, forsaking Apollos, and declaring their allegiance to Jesus alone. Their their love, their faith, their service, their perseverance. I mean, I don't know about you, but I wish Jesus would say that about our church, right? I mean, these are awesome and amazing attributes for any church to hear. And that our deeds of late are greater than at first. I don't know about you, but do you remember when you first came to Christ and how excited you were? I mean, really the the term is on fire, right? And everybody else that gets annoyed by you because you're sharing the gospel with them every moment you see them, right? You're willing to lead Bible studies wherever because you're always carrying your Bible around with you. I mean, just everybody who didn't know, like hasn't seen you, right? They, they know that you're a Christian because you've let everybody know, right? Remember what that was like. This church is doing more now for the cause of Christ than they were at first, when they were first planted, when they were first on fire. They had built such a foundation that everything was moving and sharing Christ with the community and bringing people, seeing the kingdom furthered one person at a time. Do 
that's how things were, that's how good things were going for them. They had their priorities right. That's a challenge for each of us individually. Think back. Are your deeds of late greater than at first? What does it take to rekindle that fire? What does it take for that to happen within a congregation? Are people coming in here for the right reasons? It's to hear, to see God worshiped, to hear the word of God preached. Do we gather and are we doing the things, the the righteous acts that Jesus is talking about here? We should see people come out of curiosity because they've seen you in public doing the things of Christ. So they have a huge commendation for this, right? Everything's going well. They're having to expand into other house churches, but here's the criticism. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Wow, this is a really big indictment. So you have this self-styled prophetess probably claiming to speak by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm sure her name wasn't Jezebel. Nobody with good conscience can name their kid that. If that's your name, I'm sorry. We can talk after. I can apologize, but but you need to know some context here, okay? So in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, there was a King Ahab and his wife, the queen of Israel at that time, was named Jezebel. She was not a native Israelite and she was wicked. She had led all Israel away from Yahweh and to worship Baal. Commissioning the uh, smithing of idols in the form of a calf for them to worship. Persecuting the priest of God and installing prophets and priests for Baal. I mean, this was wholesale, systematic, government-sanctioned idol worship. And so this Jezebel, who led all of this, is now being brought up because there were some key things that went along with idol worship. There was always sacrifices. There's also a lot of sexual immorality, all in worship to these deities. And Apollos wasn't any different. He required much of the same things. So even in the city of Thyatira, there's a direct comparison there. And so Jesus is calling this out. Not because they are Jezebel, but because someone in their midst is a Jezebel teaching false things. And they tolerate it. So everything's going great. All the seats are filled. Got great momentum for ministry. But there's this one thing. There's somebody who claims to be speaking by the Holy Spirit and saying it's okay to worship these idols, to eat the things sacrificed to them, and even participate in some of the worship activities. Oh, but how easy would it be? They tolerate her. Well, are they wanting to not compromise the growth and momentum that they've seen in the church? This is serious. How easy is it to just overlook some of those teaching and some of those activities and to just focus on the good things? Not just as a church, but what if, what in, your, in our own lives or in our families? 
Where is there compromise? Where are we tolerating compromise within our own lives? We just got done worshiping and claiming Jesus as king, king over the whole earth. And that is completely relevant to what we're reading here. Now, there's actually another whole layer to this. It's because for the people, if they were to to, to participate in the guilds, they had to offer sacrifices to Apollos. They had to participate in the festivities. To reject that is to be ostracized, is to be removed and kicked out of the trade union. And you've got to do something else. You've got to do, you've got to find other work. Odds are you'll have to travel for that too because it's not going to happen in that city. But here Jezebel was saying, oh, no, no, no. God wants you to provide for your family. So it's okay to sacrifice to Apollos. It's okay to go through those festivities. That's why Jesus died. That's the heresy here is that grace is not meant to cover your act of rebellion against God. That there is a call to holiness for each and every one of us in devotion to King Jesus. The one who went to the cross on our behalf. This isn't legalism. This is holiness. Grace is not meant for you to worship other gods. And somehow that got confused in Thyatira. Now, praise the Lord, this isn't a big temptation for us in the 21st century in Columbus, Indiana. But we still need to be on guard against the false teaching that grace enables you to sin. Grace has provided us the freedom to live lives, to live saved in obedience to God. That we're not carrying the burden of working like on our salvation. That we're already saved and now we're free to obey, not free to disobey. That's the difference. And so Jezebel was mixing this all up but it was convenient because the cost for rejecting Apollos and pledging allegiance to Jesus, that brought about some economic hardship. Rejection from friends, from family, from coworkers. Imagine if at your job, this was a requirement, what would you do? Where is your line of compromise? I want to tell you, there shouldn't be. There shouldn't be a line of compromise. Jesus is everything. Now, There's also some arguments that 1 Corinthians 8, 4, an idol is nothing at all. This is actually what we see from the Balaam in Pergamum. So Jezebel could suggest, what's an idol? It's nothing. It's all make-believe. But here we see Jesus drawing that line that these idols are something that there is rebellion against God. It's a focus of that rebellion. Now here's the warning. I gave her time to repent and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. I wish it stopped right here and we jumped to 24, but... And I will kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Now the children here 
are the disciples of Jezebel's teaching. That she obviously had something of a following. This Jezebel was in leadership. Even there's some that think that Jezebel might've been the wife of a church leader or bishop so that she was in a natural position of authority. And that people came and just accepted that teaching. And really that's one of the things, let, before we get into uh, some of this other stuff, I want to encourage everybody, test everything. Be in the word of God yourselves to be able to discern that when you are hearing something from this stage, from on TV, wherever it is, that you can discern that the Holy Spirit within you in combination with the word of God that you have read can be able to discern what is truth and what is false teaching. Okay, tangent over. There you go. And so, <laughs> and as we're reading this, we get into Jeremiah 17, 10, right? Because there's, a, there's an issue here, judging according to deeds. But in Jeremiah, he says, I, Yahweh, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Now, you can just hear that in the, the negative, but you can also hear that in the positive. Let me encourage a little balance there. That all the things that you have done for the cause of Christ that nobody else knows about, the sacrifices that you have made, the times that you have overcome temptation, God sees that every single time and he remembers. I think a lot of times we read verses like this and it's like, oh, I am in so much trouble. But he remembers, he recalls all the good things as well. Matthew 16, starting at verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? This is pretty relevant to Thyatira, isn't it? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the son of man is going to come in the glory of his father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. This is something that we see Old Testament, New Testament. We see this throughout Revelation. That the lives that we lead in Christ matters. The actions that we take and don't take, the things that we speak up against, the things we tolerate, the things we compromise on, that matters. And it's time for us to stand up. It's time for us to stop tolerating those things in our own lives, in our hearts. Let us focus on the Lord and giving our allegiance to him as our king and renounce the sin in our lives. Renounce the sin that we tolerate as a church or as a culture. Let us seek the Lord. And so here's how Jesus counsels this church. But I say to you, the rest of you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. So knowing Satan's deep secret, secrets is a reference to the view that in order to appreciate fully the grace of God, one must first plumb the depths of evil. Later Gnosticism boasted it was precisely by entering into the stronghold of Satan that believers could learn the limits of his power and emerge victorious. That sounds like a dangerous game. <laughs> but still there were people that were hearing this teaching and tolerating it and not putting it down. On the basis that a believer's spirituality is unaffected by what is done with the body, Jezebel could argue that the Thyatiran Christians ought to take part in the pagan guild feast, 
even if they were connected with the deep secrets of Satan, and thus prove how powerless evil is to alter the nature of grace. How sinister is that? We need to stay anchored in the truth. We need to know God's word. We need to to press into the things that are maybe a little bit challenging and uncomfortable. Uh, Even today, there there might be some of a reaction between like, oh, God's going to judge us according to our deeds. But we need to press in. We need to understand these things so that we're not led astray. Because what we do here in this life matters. We are called, when we pledged our allegiance to Jesus, when we accepted him as our savior, we have been enlisted to further the kingdom of God. And it's by faithful allegiance to the cause of Christ that believers overcome the world. The world with all of its hostile environment of pagan values and practices. Now, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? This is another concept. If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So we ourselves, so as Jesus is talking to this church in Thyatira, he is calling them to to judge wisely, to overcome. And that those who overcome, those who will confront and root out this false teaching, that they have a place of ruling and reigning with him. In Revelation 5, we read, and this is as they were looking for someone to open up the scroll, the scroll of judgments. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God and they will reign upon the earth. Have you ever heard that before? As we're going through this life, as we're making these judgment calls day in and day out of what devotion to Christ looks like within our context, choosing right from wrong, this echoes in eternity. This is almost like tryouts for what eternity is going to look like with Jesus as our King. That puts an interesting gravity to, to the choices that we make. We're not just flowing and drifting through life. That's not what we've been saved to do. We have been saved to be ambassadors for Christ. How much do we believe eternity is going to happen? We have all known death. We have seen it. We've lost loved ones and friends. It's a reality. It's a reality we don't like to talk about. We don't like to face, but it's coming. This got really dark, sorry. (laughs) But it's the reality for each and every one of us. And we have to face it. Eternity is coming and it'll be eternity with Jesus or not. But I pray every single one of us here know the gospel and have put our faith in Christ. But we get to rule and reign with him. That there is a whole nother life to come. And I pray that that thought, that idea, that truth is what sparks something within us to live more boldly for the cause of Christ. 
to sacrifice jobs when they cause us, when they call us to sacrifice to Apollos, to forsake God and worship something else of this world. That it, this life isn't everything that we're looking at at eternity. So there's three lessons from Thyatira. One, keep up the good work. It's kind of funny to circle back around now. Keep up the good work. I know your deeds, your love, and faith, and service, and perseverance, that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Keep up the good work. Second, repent of tolerance and complacency. This is the only thing that Jesus had against them is that they tolerated the woman Jezebel. Remove her from leadership. Do not let her into the fellowship unless she repents. And we can always extend that grace, but there is a clear call for her to repent and to stop teaching that way. And the third thing, hold fast. Verse 25, nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Those deeds that have been great of late, greater than the ones at first, keep it up. Hold fast, protect yourself, have discernment, protect yourself from the false teaching and any other false teaching that would try to make its way into the fellowship. Do this individually, do this within your families and we can do this within our church. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you that the word given 2000 years ago can speak to us so clearly today. The Father, you be glorified. As we devote ourselves to serving and glorifying you, that we can sing all hail King Jesus, that as you have given him that authority, that he shares that authority with his faithful. Help us to see eternity every waking moment of our day. Help us to st step out in faith and to share good news with those around us and to live that good news self-sacrificially beginning within our homes. Father, we thank you for what you have done in redeeming us through Christ. To you be the glory now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want to thank you for being here today. As you go out, take the good news of the gospel with you. You are dismissed.